The following is a brief and virtual conversation about innovation. In the next few minutes, we hope to engage your mind, enlighten your curiosity, and enhance your knowledge of innovation best practices. Caution, it may change the way you think about innovation. So let's start out with a what if question. What if innovation could be on demand and systematic? But isn't systematic innovation an oxymoron? You know those two words that just don't fit together? Many people mistakenly think so. In fact, Henry Ford had it right when he said, whether you believe you're creative or not, you are right. Most people believe innovation is something only the special can do. They think you're either born with it or not. No! Studies also show that most people have difficulty thinking outside the box. Yet there are others that consistently generate great ideas, individuals and companies. Could adding some discipline or structure improve the innovation process for those who have difficulty? But we all know too much structure and discipline can stifle anything, especially innovation. That's true, but too little structure is even worse. Okay, even if innovation could be structured, can it be taught and learned? The answer is absolutely. Many things are being taught that significantly increase your innovation IQ. One of them is an eight-step process called systematic innovation. We define systematic innovation as a structured process and set of practical tools anyone can use to create or improve products, processes, or services that deliver new value to your customers. So how does systematic innovation work? And where does it come from? Well, it's time to show you. It started with a study of great minds like these and thousands of other not so famous but equally brilliant inventors and problem solvers. Now I'm sure you recognize each one of these people and their significant contributions. What they all have in common is a passion for science, inventing, and innovation. Now here's the really cool part. Hundreds of inventive principles and innovation best practices have been extracted and organized from the collective study of their work. And at the risk of oversimplifying things, these principles and best practices have been stripped of their subject matter, generalized, and then structured into a format that can be used by anyone in any industry. Whether you're working on products, services, software, business processes, manufacturing, healthcare, it doesn't matter. So to summarize, systematic innovation is a process and set of continually evolving tools that will improve your ability to innovate on demand by creating new value for your customers. Want to learn a little more? Continue watching and we'll give you a brief introduction to each of the eight steps in our systematic innovation process. Let's start with step one of eight, understanding your customers better than they understand themselves. So the first question is, should you explore or ignore your customers when it comes to innovation? There's a great deal of debate around this, but the quick answer is both. You need to do both with intention and purpose. Since customers, whether they're internal or external, are why we exist and the beneficiaries of all innovation, this critical first step helps us to begin to understand the customer's needs not only by using conventional voice of customer methods, but also recognizing the critical fact that customers, especially external, are simply not effective at articulating all the requirements that will win their future business. So special tools must be used to go beyond what the customers can tell you. We start this step with deeply understanding the Kano model. The Kano model explains three different types of needs customers have that are critical for success. Now we're not going to get into the detail of this model. I'll show you where you can get some more information on it in a minute. But you'll find that all three of these needs have a different impact on customer satisfaction. The first of three main needs are called performance needs, or Kano called them one-dimensional. These are the requirements that customers talk about and are at the top of their minds when choosing from alternatives. Basic needs, or must-bes, are the needs customers won't tell you about. They don't talk about them because they're expected. They're so obvious they go without saying. And the third type is excitement, or delighters. These are the needs that customers don't articulate because they don't know about them yet. They're the innovations, the wows, the gee whizzes that differentiate your product from the competition. 
Now there's a website, www.conomodel.com, that has a great six-minute animated video with much more detail on this model. Check it out when you have some time. Also in step two, we introduce the cage model, which clearly shows you why typical voice of customer activities only show you part of what's needed for success. Search cage model on YouTube for a nice six minute animated video tutorial and learn a lot more about it. After all the customer research is complete, we thoroughly organize, document, and strategically prioritize the requirements into development opportunities using the VOC opportunity matrix shown here. So a quick summary of the tools used in step one you can see listed here. There are several tools that get into exploring customer needs and there are several that go beyond what the customers will tell you to get at some of their latent needs and things that they cannot articulate. This brings us to step two of eight, analyzing the situation. Once we understand the customer needs and the key opportunities for value creation and growth from step one, Situation analysis helps us further understand the problem and solution space available for each of the targeted opportunities. One of Einstein's great classic quotes was, if I were given an hour to solve a problem my life depended on, I would spend 55 minutes studying it and 5 minutes solving it. We think his point was to understand the problem very well before jumping into solutions. Creating a function model does exactly this. Now we're not going to go through the details of function modeling and I know you can't read the screen here but we're going to tell you the, the goals of function modeling. Function modeling helps us with four main things. Number one, to clarify the project scope. Describing the functional physics of the product or process, its environment and the interactions helps the team reach agreement on the problem and solution space available. The second thing is to identify standard problems. The definition of a standard problem is a problem which is described or characterized into a format that has been seen or solved somewhere before. Number three is discover reformulated problems. A reformulated problem is a problem that has been elaborated to a point that allows for a completely different solution path than the original problem statement. And the fourth thing function modeling helps you do is to surface future problems. A future problem is a problem that the customers don't recognize yet or they believe it's impossible to solve so they don't care or talk about them. So a summary of the tools used in step two are several different function modeling techniques. This brings us to step three of eight, selecting an appropriate idea generation and problem solving tool for the job. We often ask people, what's the best tool in your house? The common answers include things like the hammer or screwdriver or duct tape. Well, actually, those are the wrong answer. The correct answer to that question is that it depends on the situation. The same applies for idea generation and problem solving tools. You must pick the appropriate tool for the specific situation. There are no one size fits all tools. Well, if having the right tool depends on the situation, you may be asking, well, what are the situations that call for inventive thinking? We actually discovered several. Here's the beginning of a list of common situations that call for inventive thinking. The first one says, to wow the customer. You want to differentiate yourself from the competition. Completely different from that would be to solve a tough technical or customer problem. Or how about reducing cost or complexity? or resolving a conflict, a situation where you try to improve one thing but then you hurt another, or to circumvent a competitor's patent. The point here is that there are several situations that call for inventive thinking and depending on the situation will dictate which tool you use to resolve it. Since you should select the best tool for the job, here's another very interesting tool to leverage. It's our own unique tool selection matrix, and this sounds a little crazy, but it's a tool that shows you which innovation tools to use. It helps the innovator select the most appropriate problem solving or idea generation tool from the reasons to innovate listed on the left side in pink. On the top are well over 25 idea generation and problem solving tools that exist. These are in yellow. The intersections of this matrix show how effective each of the innovation tools are at addressing those reasons to innovate in pink. In step four, we'll take a look at each of these problem solving and innovation tools in more detail and use them to solve problems and generate ideas. 
That brings us to step four of eight, generating ideas and concepts. This is the heart of the systematic innovation process and where we spend almost 50% of our time. It's the main step where new ideas are born and problems are solved. By the way, teams with very well-defined problem statements can actually start in this step. So in step four, we introduce several left and right brain idea generation and problem solving tools. The left brain tools are based on science and technology, while the right brain tools are based on psychology. Here's a list of the right and left brain tools we use in step four. Remember, step three helps us choose the appropriate tools from this comprehensive list. So step four has a comprehensive and diverse set of idea generation and problem solving tools for your projects. It contains over 25 uniquely effective techniques. Some are simple and can be learned in minutes. Others are more complex and take time to practice and master to effectively use. This brings us to step five of eight. Evaluate, synthesize, and select the best concept. The decision made in concept evaluation is an essential and non-trivial part of all design projects. Teams that make too quick of a decision on the best concept often have it come back to haunt them. So several methods for concept evaluation and selection exist, ranging from throwing darts to simple multi-voting techniques to sophisticated mathematical methods that take into consideration multiple opinions, confidence level, and risk. One of the popular tools we often suggest is the Pew Concept Evaluation Technique. The power of Pew is its simplicity and having a comprehensive list of objective criteria to evaluate the alternatives. What you see here is a matrix, alternative concepts across the top and evaluation criteria on the left side. An evaluation is done to decide which is the best concept and then from that we create a modified version. The goal of Pew is not to pick a winner, it's actually to come up with something better than all the original concepts. There are several ways to modify concept evaluation techniques to get rid of some of their inherent weaknesses. Other techniques are used in this step as well to enhance the evaluation process. Which brings us to step six of eight, detailed design. This is a critical step that happens after the front end of product development, and most organizations have adequate expertise and tools to support it. However, many of the tools described in step four, generating ideas and concepts, may also be utilized when doing the detailed design, especially when technical problems are encountered. So here's a list of common tools used in this step. Which brings us to step number seven, communicating value to the customer. Any new idea or innovation will die on the vine if your customers, whether they're internal or external, don't understand and buy into their concept's value proposition. Why is that? It's because new ideas disrupt and disturb social and political equilibriums. People don't want their boat rocked, and innovators do exactly that by upsetting the delicate balance. So in step seven, to increase the likelihood of acceptance of new ideas, several guidelines and tactics are introduced on how to sell your ideas to improve the likelihood of acceptance and buy-in. This last step retains and integrates the key lessons learned in all of the eight steps, and it's essential to maintaining the gains for future products. So we reflect, communicate, and standardize on best practices and tools used in each step in this current project. Well, your brief introduction is over. I hope you enjoyed it. There's much more detail available. Contact us with questions or to learn the detail behind each of these eight steps. We offer training, coaching, workshops, project facilitation, on-demand webinars, and train-the-trainer programs. Ah, one last point. You should consider these eight steps as a menu of tasks. We recommend only the steps, tasks, and sub-steps that are necessary or needed for your project situation. So these eight steps should be used as guidelines. Most often we use all eight steps, but there are situations where we pick and choose the steps that are appropriate for the project. Thank you.